thousands of years ago, you know, mankind has always looked at uh, to the heavens, trying to understand where Mars is in a small dot in the sky. Uh, even the Babylonians, Babylonians, 400 years ago, I mean, 400 BC, they were trying to understand what these planets meant. Then we had Copernicus, we had Galileo, Tycho Brahe from uh, Denmark, also investigating Mars. Now, really, what is the purpose of all this and why Mars? You know, what is the reason we want to go to Mars? And why did NASA decide to embark on this ambitious journey? So when we asked some of the people in NASA, they said, wow, moon was a camping trip. <laughs> now we are living and working in the International Space Station. So we know how to do this. We've done that, been there, done that, seen it. So, okay, we are going to go to Mars. Really, why Mars? So why did Columbus sail uh, west? Why did Marco Polo head east? Um, it's in our DNA. Exploration is always in our DNA. The real reason to uh, embark on this ambitious journey to Mars is uh, realization of our own dreams, basically. You know, it gives us a... Mankind has been always curious about the unknown. So we try to find out uh, what is out there, you know, and now as you know, we put the windows to the universe in Hubble Space Telescope, and that really has done wonders to tell us where we came from, how old is Earth, and things like that. Obviously, study of Mars also gives us an opportunity to understand if there is life on Mars, or life in our solar system, or anywhere else. Last but not least, you know, if you don't trust me, <laughs> and if you don't trust NASA to go to Mars, just you have to trust uh, Stephen Hawking. He said, next thousand years, mankind cannot survive if we don't explore and get off this planet and find another place to live on. So I'm sure you'll trust him. So really, uh, we just talked about uh, global uh, warming and other issues. I just came back from Greenland about a few years ago, and I really f see I, the uh, glacial uh, icebergs and uh, glaciers melting over there. So that's the truth. So, Really, we need to find. We don't want to be extinct like uh, the dinosaurs 65 million years before us. So before we do that, we want to go and explore Mars. So we'll give you an overview of some of the Mars surface features, uh, talked about a little bit about strategy and obstacles, some habitat challenges we have, uh, talk a little bit about unmanned missions in the past, and really, NASA is going to Mars, guys. You know, we are going to Mars by 2030. That's for sure. So with that introduction, let's uh, go. Uh, so Mars, as you all know, it's, um, it's a fourth planet from the sun. It's commonly referred to as red planet, obviously. A lot of iron oxide in the system. It's rust, basically. So we need to uh, look at our neighbor and understand the, the, uh, uh, the environment there before we go up there. Mars was named after the Roman god of war, basically, and it you know, was really worshipped and revered. So this was based on a lot of uh, uh, military achievement and stuff like that. So they wanted to name their gods after you know, various planets. This is a beautiful picture of uh, Hubble Space Telescope taken uh, way back in the 90s. And you can see some of the, uh, it provides a very good global coverage. I think it was taken about 100 million kilometers away. Amazing pictures. So we earlier talked about windows to the universe, really, and Hubble is doing a great job for us. So how does the Mars terrain or atmosphere look like? So it's a rocky, dry terrain. A lot of volcanoes similar to Earth. You know, we have similar features with Mars and us. The atmosphere is much thinner there. Um, Com comprised mainly of carb carbon dioxide and stuff like that. And gravity, unlike Earth, you know, unlike Moon, it's about one third the gravity of our own, uh, which is 1G here. So Mars uh, atmosphere, really, it's uh, unbreathable right now. So lots of dust storms you see in the movie Martian. How many people have seen Martian movie? Great. <laughs> I'm done here, so you, you already know about Mars. <laughs> Hey, we, got, we went to Mars and we came back and brought Matt Damon back, right? So, uh, yes, there is very little water. So as we 
uh, try to embark on missions to Mars and trying to uh, give you a lot of perspective on you know what we find up there in various Mars missions. So let's take a look at Mars features. You know they're very similar to Earth. A lot of craters. Uh, we have a lot of volcanoes up there. You know we also have canyons. You know some of the canyons are as big as uh, United States. We'll take a look at it. So uh, we have a lot of uh, river channels, lava rocks, reddish uh, uh, volcano rocks seeps through all this. So the largest volcano uh, in our uh, solar system is, uh, you know, is as big as the uh, state of Arizona in the United States, if you know about Arizona. So it's uh, very high, as high as Mount Everest, uh, three times higher than Mount Everest, in fact. So now this particular gigantic canyon we talked about, uh, it's a very vast canyon. It's as long as the United States. It's very, very big. And here's a map of the United States, you know, put on the same valley there. So seasons on Mars. So seasons are much longer there. Uh, obviously, you know, we have a lot of dust storms associated with the seasons and stuff like that. Okay, now as far as the similarities and comparisons go, now this gives you a good understanding of how large Mars is compared to Earth and, and uh, also how far we are from the Sun. It's important for us to know how far we are from the Sun because as we go farther and farther away, the, the climate gets very cold and closer to the Sun, obviously, we are much, much hotter. So uh, the environment on Mars provides a very good opportunity for, for NASA to uh, uh, have a similar planet where you know, humans can go and live. So NASA's, I mean, uh, the Mars has two um, uh, uh, moons. So obviously, you know, they're named like panic and fear. How about that? So <laughs> yeah, similar to Earth, right? We are, a lot of times we go into panic mode and we are fearful of a lot of things. So, well, fear has two meanings. You know, forget everything and run up the hill or face everything and rise. So NASA is looking at, before landing on Mars, we want to have a base on um, one of its moons. So really, what are the obstacles and what is NASA's strategy to go to Mars, basically? Well, as I said earlier, uh, we had, we are, you know, we have footprints on the moon. So really, sky was the not limit, right? So now we are going to Mars and putting footprints on Mars. So um, some uh, early exploration concepts, you know, looked at uh, uh, looking at water really. And you know, once you have this water, you know, that says there is some life forms. And if the environment is right, or you know, if the environment is not right, you know, we still can go and live up there. By the by, um, uh, the European Space Agency, uh, in collaboration with the Russians, they sent ExoMars recently. And Chaparelli is one of the probes which is going to be landing there. So strategy for NASA uh, is to follow the water, basically. So the water is a main ingredient for, you know, mass law, law of hierarchy, food, water, shelter, right? Basically, that's all uh, is required if you want to have a habitat anywhere in the world or the universe. So getting to Mars, really, you know, it's a big challenge. It's uh, nothing to sneeze about, really. So, you know, when you want to go into the Mars um, orbit, you know, it depends on how fast you are going or how slow you are going. So if you are too high, you know, you cannot slow down and you can crash land. And if you go too slow or too low, the friction will kill you basically. So there is, it's very important for us to go at the right speed. And as you, if you haven't seen the video, of a Mars Curiosity rover, it calls the seven minutes of terror. It's a classic example of what engineers can do from Jet Propulsion Lab up in Pasadena, California. They landed the Curiosity rover with a precise idea and precise uh, challenging environment uh, uh, and landed safely on Mars. Well, launch, launching a rocket to Mars is itself is a big deal. Uh, launch, uh, 
I con consider it as World War III with the gravity really. Uh, cruising up there and having the right orbit insertion and braking basically, you know, has been used by many different techniques uh, including Mars Curiosity. So, basically we have done uh, not only landed on Mars uh, once, but seven times and NASA is the only entity to date who has landed on Mars. Obviously, uh, we did not count Matt Damon, right. Uh, journey to Mars is uh, even tougher for humans basically. So, what we have done in the past as far as unmanned missions go, we have and as you know, uh, if when you are a baby you need to crawl before you walk and you have to walk before you run. So, NASA strategically did many, many baby steps like having flybys to understand the Martian environment, having orbiters orbit it and look at the temperatures and other things, come up with a lander mechanism where it can land and maybe not even go too far, a penetrator to get some soil samples and study the soil. Um, then we had rovers to ro go around basically, you know, hey guys and gals, you know, uh, robots are taking over, believe me. <laughs> so, NASA is wanting to send an army of robots to uh, Mars. So, we better get smartened up, you know, because otherwise they will rule us, you know, once we go to Mars. They will be our bosses. So, we do not want to let them be our bosses. So, look at the missions here, amazing number of missions on Mars, right. So, uh, this uh, uh, really exemplifies uh, NASA's effort way back from 1960s and uh, going into uh, even today basically. Uh, we started with Mariner uh, expeditions and then Viking 1 and 2. Uh, then we went into some uh, issues with uh, better, faster, cheaper kind of philosophy where uh, NASA did not do a lot of testing and other things which cost us a lot of time and effort and lost our probes in uh, some of the uh, entities like uh, climate observer, polar lander and stuff like that. And finally, we had the, the two probes uh, spirit and opportunity on the Mars exploration rover uh, which, which landed on Mars. So, finally, more recently we uh, used Mars Science Laboratory and landed Curiosity rover. So, really, uh, we are, uh, the green item there shows how many times we have landed on Mars. So, you know, my idea is not to really bore you with a lot of uh, this uh, 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 information on various past missions, but just want to highlight you on uh, some of the things we have done in the past. So, uh, we will look at uh, start with Mariner, you know, the table we just saw earlier. So, it was a flyby, uh, it did not really get to Mars, you know, uh, we had a lot of issues with it uh, as we were trying to launch and then basically, you know, it ended up uh, in uh, a problem because what happened was the solar panels did not want to work properly and it, it really uh, did not meet our mission criteria. Then we went to uh, 1964, we launched, uh, the dates are already there. So, we had a first flyby of the Mars, um, you know, look at the pictures, the amount of pictures we took, like 22 pictures, <laughs> uh, data size, three, 600 kilobyte. I have a zip drive here, thumb drive which is like, you know, 34 giga, uh, gigabytes right now. So, amazing cut type of technologies uh, and Im improvements in technology since the last 50 years. That is a direct influence of what a space exploration can do for you, completely a transform your quality of life on earth. So, no intelligent life, we got some first deep space image. So, that is interesting for us. Uh, Mariner uh, 6 and 7 really they were dual missions. We wanted to make sure we go around the polar uh, aspect of it in, uh, including the equator, equatorial area and then we did not find any intelligent life on Mars either, you know. So, but we got to study the atmosphere. So, like you know any other place, we are working right now in Hawaii trying to uh, uh, learn about Mars and how to live longer sending man to Mars and uh, understanding the climate and understanding the, the uh, closeness of environment, how to work psychological and physiological issues and stuff like that. So, this is really a precursor to understanding what happened. So, Mariner uh, 8 also had the problem, basically it did return the images, but really uh, we had a launch failure 
and the uh, loss of mission basically because one of the upper stages so what happens to a rocket is you can only go so far right uh, so basically a rocket uh, with a chemical propulsion like uh, liquid oxygen liquid hydrogen and stuff like that can take you to maybe 200 300 kilometers up in space so how do we put uh, satellites up in space like uh, uh, tracking and data relay satellites and stuff like that we use what they call as inertial upper stage it's a boosting rocket so that puts your satellite into 20,000, 30,000 kilometer orbit and they are more stable orbits. That is why you get your cell phone data quite accurately or GPS and stuff like that. So here one of the inertial upper stage rockets uh, failed on, the, uh, on this mission and basically you know it created a problem. So um, Mariner 9 again it was attempted flyby, first to orbit a new planet, sent a lot of pictures now, we are you know, gaining ground now. So we mapped many, many uh, uh, large areas, uh, we photographed the moon, you know, uh, and things like that, you know. Uh, basically, a lot of times, you know, not only hardware can fail, but even software can fail. So sometimes when software error fails, when we get up close, we end up, you know, uh, getting, you know, the mission fails. And it costs us a lot of money, tremendous amount of money and work and uh, things go into this business. So uh, these are the areas where the seven successful landings of, uh, by NASA basically. So just to quote um, Werner von Braun, you know, this is coming from uh, Apollo program, but you know, his famous quote was, you know, with nine women pregnant, you, know, you can get a baby in one month. So you know, this takes a lot of effort. You know, this <laughs> hard work is very, very hard work, uh, ingenious ideas, uh, things like, you know, all the team working together and stuff like that to put something on here. So now really the biggest challenge we had was the Viking missions. They uh, exactly almost uh, uh, seven years of our Apollo landing way back in July 1969, we had an opportunity to land Viking missions on Mars. And they were sending even more pictures, you know, uh, not only the orbiters were sending pictures, but the landers were sending pictures. We checked for soil for life on Mars. We also looked at uh, if there are any uh, living organisms on Mars. Uh, well, for both two reasons, one to understand life on Mars, but also if you send astronauts, what happens to them, you know? There may be some issues with them, you know, dealing with microorganisms and stuff like that, you know, they may get um, reactions and stuff like that, so. Well, Viking 2 really followed uh, where Viking 1 left off and basically it um, operated for uh, more than 1000 days uh, and after a certain period of time you know the Martian environment is so uh, difficult to work with uh, that you know, it, you know sometimes dust storms and stuff like that can cover up your rocket and then there is, uh, um, uh, th there is no communication between uh, Houston and some of the places um, you know some of the probes which were up in space. So Viking 1 and 2 landed in what they call as Christ Planetia, uh, uh, you know, uh, place of gold basically and you know it looks like you know because of the red dust and stuff like that. So Mars environment uh, as far as Mars environment goes, uh, Mars is self sterilizing you know uh, we have a lot of ultraviolet radiation up there, uh, it saturates the surface. You can grow anything there food wise. So basically you know the soil chemistry um, and life on Mars really was is questionable right now and uh, until we really uh, go and dig deep into water uh, surfaces and stuff like that, that's when we'll really find out if there are, there are any living organisms on Mars. Well now comes the real robotic part and where a lot of times you know uh, a philosophy of uh, faster, better, cheaper uh, by NASA management really led to some of these failures in the 90s. So as you see, most of these are unmanned robotic probes and I said robots are going to be even doing more work on Mars in future. Uh, so in this case, uh, you know, uh, we had um, uh, a fuel tank rupture on one of these uh, crafts and we lost uh, the, the uh, probe and you know the mission was unsuccessful. 
global surveyor, I took a lot of pictures, mapped Mars, and uh, basically, you know, it gave very high resolution images, you know, of Mars basically. And, you know, getting images was a big deal, you know, transferring the, you know, you are talking about 4 to 20 minutes of communication gap between here and Mars, you know, 6 months to go up there. So really, you know, we are talking about very, very difficult environment. So Mars Pathfinder was another lander rover combination. Um, it did uh, use a balloon system if uh, you have seen pictures of that uh, because of the impact, you know, we wanted to make sure that the impact gets, uh, uh, doesn't damage, uh, you know, not create vibration during landing on the Mars and then, you know, we could land this uh, balloon system so that it shocks the impact, you know, reduces the loads and then uh, we, we have a uh, probe uh, like in this case Sojourner. Uh, which can go around and try to do its job. So basically, I said landing was the biggest deal and we'll show a little bit about uh, Mars uh, Curiosity a little bit later. So, little Sojourner, uh, there was a rover that could do it. It was an instrumented lander, basically. Uh, uh, it, it did uh, go on Mars and, you know, opened up a solar arrays and stuff like that. And, um, you know, uh, it went around giving us a lot, lot more information. So, you know, we need to understand the environment where we want to live in. So, sending rovers is a great idea. Just by using a flyby or, or orbiter, you know, we are not going to get a lot of data, basically. We have to land, land there and understand what's going on. Another orbiter, Mars Climate Observer, again launched in 98. Uh, there was a unit conversion error between some of the NASA engineers and Lockheed Martin engineers. And basically, this meant that uh, the probe failed and uh, basically we lost it and uh, uh, we lost the probe. Uh, it did a hard landing and it was damaged upon arrival. So now comes Mars Polar Lander. Again, it's an attempted lander. Uh, Again, this had another problem uh, when the thrusters, uh, because of the software error, they shut down too soon. So as the probe was coming and trying to land, it thought we are, I already landed, so I'm going to slow down now. And then it came crash landing basically, and we lost the probe. So another uh, probe failure, which was a penetrator, uh, that also had a hardware issue, and we lost the mission basically. So in 1999, we started working on the Mars Odyssey, and basically it it left uh, it started where the Mars Global Surveyor started, and uh, it really found some caves and uh, map found some water near the poles, things like that. So basically, uh, we are trying to understand the radiation and some other issues, finding minerals, whether we could mine. So right now at Kennedy Space Center, we are looking at what they call as in situ resource utilization, which is really helping us to understand what minerals we have on, uh, on Mars and how we can use it. So now the two little rovers uh, exploration, uh, I mean Spirit and uh, Opportunity were sent uh, with the Mars exploration rovers. And this is the first time really uh, we uh, want to study the water activity on Mars. And, uh, how the uh, planet's environment was uh, affected over a time, basically, over hundreds of thousands of years. So, uh, you know, obviously we need to study the rocks also, but also the uh, samples, Earth samples. You know, uh, in future we'll have a sample return mission, but right now all we could do is dig uh, the ground but and take the samples and study the samples and then uh, do the analysis right there and send the data back. So, again, I don't want to dwell too much on the uh, lot of instruments NASA is sending on these uh, 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 missions, but ma mainly, you know, uh, anywhere we find the craters and, you know, um, areas where there are uh, microscopic, uh, you know, cracks or big cracks or valleys, we want to look for water, you know, and once we find water, you know, that's, that's the main uh, reason why why we are doing all these robotic explorations, because we don't want to carry water. It cost me $10,000 per pound of uh, uh, pound 
of water to send up in space. One pound of apple cost me $10,000 to send to the International Space Station. So uh, it's a tremendous amount of cost. So we all, I don't want to be sending uh, water to Mars. You know, we want to see whether we can do it in situ uh, resource utilization. So uh, again, um, we start working, I mean, we, we looked at uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. I mean, that was taking very high resolution pictures now. Also, they're sending more and more data now, right? 1,000 DVDs, it can cover up to 1,000 DVDs. And uh, still, still uh, the amount of data coming in from Mars is humongous. And uh, because these pictures take long, a large amount of, uh, uh, you know, and these are very high resolution pictures. So basically, mapping the area uh, gives us a lot of idea about you know whether there is water inside there or uh, what kind of minerals we have basically. So uh, we had another uh, mission, the Phoenix uh, Scout lander, basically, and then uh, this uh, landed in the frozen uh, Arctic plain. Um, it dug for water and stuff like that. Again, um, you know we. The whole idea of sending these robotic missions is to find water, as we said earlier. Now, the real, real crux came when, when really NASA wanted to send uh, a bigger rover. So all the rovers earlier uh, we sent like uh, Spirit and Opportunity were very tiny compared to this big unit, which is uh, Mars Curiosity rover. And um, compared in size, if uh, the Mars uh, um, Spirit and Opportunity were say 100 kilos, now we are talking about uh, curiosity of almost 1,000 kilos, 10 times uh, bigger in size. So now when you have bigger size, we talked about capabilities to land on Mars and stuff like that. So NASA came up with a very unique device. And you know, if, if, you, uh, don't, if you haven't seen it already, I want you to see the uh, seven minutes of terror video on the, on the YouTube, and it's free, so you can see that. And that's... Uh, uh, this sequence of uh, operations up here basically. So uh, here we start entering around 10 minutes. The entry is about 8 minutes and we get into the velocity, particular velocity we have to decelerate. And as we decelerate, we deploy a parachute around 11 kilometers up in sky. Now, you know, uh, the uh, rover is inside here. So the heat shield has to come out and the parachute still has to work. And then as radar collects the data on the ground, you know, we keep on coming and open, you know, we take this whole system off and just dump the rover up here and we have a slow descent. But then as the jets on the rover work together, the rover is still inside here hiding behind a shell. And if that particular thing lands and the rover lands on here, these plumes of the rocket, which is hiding the shell, we call the sky, sky crane maneuver, it could burn off the rover. So it's, it was very important for us to have all this sequence of events very, very you know, precise to the millionth of a second. If you miss any of this sequence of operations, it would just lack crash land or burn up. So, and then as it lands, basically, you know, this whole sky crane just has to take off so that the plumes don't hit the rover. And once they hit the rover, we are done. The mission fails up there. So, Curiosity landed in the place uh, we call the Gale Crater, and uh, it shows the Gale Crater up there, and also the location of the Gale Crater, very close to Spirit. So uh, we had uh, one, uh, another mission launched recently, about a few years ago, 2013, uh, to study Martian atmosphere. Again, this was a orbiter, and uh, Mainly, you know, we have issues with carbon dioxide. Now NASA is looking at uh, how to use that carbon dioxide uh, and convert that into portable water for our astronauts so that I don't have to send water. And at Kennedy Space Center, we are developing the technology right now as we speak. So the future manned missions, uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about that. So really, up to now, uh, NASA has only sent unmanned probes to Mars. And uh, basically, if you don't understand the environment, and uh, uh, obviously, like we say in uh, Maslow's Law of Hierarchy, you need food, water, and shelter. 
for all of us to live and survive in an environment. So basically, the same thing applies to Mars. So we are talking about very cold temperatures, very thin atmosphere, radiation issues, um, habitats, food, water. These are all the real uh, challenges for, um, uh, for uh, NASA's manned mission. So if uh, landing Curiosity was a very difficult job, now sending man would require or entail a lot of, lot of issues and notwithstanding the entry and descent landing. So we cannot crash land, uh, you know, rovers, I mean landers with, with men in there and kill them basically. So it's very, very important. So really up to now, NASA has really uh, gone beyond uh, what we call as, uh, uh, we, you know, we have gone to moon six, uh, five, uh, six times. We have uh, repaired Hubble uh, seven, uh, five times. We are already uh, living in space on the International Space Station for the last 15 years. So we know how to live and work in uh, low Earth orbit, which is about 200 to 300 kilometers up in space. Now, really we want to go beyond Earth orbit. And that's, what, that's where the next challenge is for us. And so again, we want to take baby steps. We want to uh, develop the technology uh, for a bigger and better rocket. So go to moon and uh, work nearby moon and have an asteroid capture mission. So we understand how to mine this asteroid and then use the same techniques and tools uh, we have, uh, you know, doing work on asteroids uh, by sending uh, meant to uh, asteroid actually from moon or from the International Space Station and then make sure that uh, we can send men to Mars. So this is a phased approach uh, which NASA is taking and rightfully so. So remember uh, way back in the 60s, um, you know, we went to moon using the rocket on the left there. That is the beautiful picture of Apollo 11 uh, which went to moon uh, from NASA Kennedy Space Center. Then we built what we call as the Cathedral of Technology. Really, Space Shuttle was a totally reusable vehicle. It did wonders for NASA, launching many, many probes like Ulysses to Sun and Galileo and um, uh, things like that. And also putting um, uh, uh, various uh, 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 telescopes like Hubble Space Telescope, Gamma, uh, uh, Compton Gamma Ray and Chandra X-ray. And now, obviously, we are going to put the new telescope, the James Webb. We can't have the opportunity to use the space shuttle. But now we are developing newer and better rockets. Uh, may not be reusable, but these are even higher thrust than, than what we are doing on the space uh, shuttle program or the Apollo program. So the rocket on the rightmost side, that's the newer space launch system, SLS. That's the name word. And the probe which will be sitting on top of the rocket is called the Orion. So we already sent Orion on what they call as uh, EFT-1, Experimental Flight Test 1, and it went 2,000 miles above um, the Earth and then came back safely back to Earth. So this is the first time we have sent any probe since the moon landings ended around 1970s, uh, 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 more than 2,000 miles. And that's the, the reason to do that is we want to send man like that. And so that's why we are testing these probes and then making sure they'll come back safely. So the architecture for, uh, it's a building block basically. It slowly builds upon the, the thrust levels. So because remember we talked about um, the Curiosity rover being 1,000 kilos compared to the, uh, uh, the other two rovers, you know, Spirit and Opportunity. Now we are going to be putting men here. Obviously, we need supplies and stuff like that. So all those things are going to cost us, you know, a weight penalty. So we are going to um, first start with the asteroid capture mission. So really, uh, the most important thing we need to do in an asteroid capture mission is to find an asteroid, you know, very close to um, uh, our environment and then redirect it you know, uh, we're using solar electric propulsion engines. So chemical engines have a limitation, uh, like liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, or even solid rocket motors. They cannot provide enough thrust and they don't last long for a long journey to Mars. Going to uh, moon, it's okay. Going to uh, low Earth orbit, it's okay, but not going to Mars for six months. And that's where NASA is developing technologies for 
uh, ion propulsion engines like using the uh, xenon uh, transfer uh, ions to really make sure that uh, we are trying to develop those uh, technologies. And then we want to explore it by sending not only uh, robots to mine and also we want to bring uh, the, uh, the mined uh, you know uh, material back to earth you know via Orion or even bring it back to moon or bring it back to the station. Um, by 2024 the station is going to be uh, uh, you know retired. So, we have to do some things before that and definitely we will be looking at uh, a moon base to support a lot of these activities or Orion based activities. So, the asteroid redirect mission will have a lot of challenges for us also. So, as we go along you know we are developing new technologies uh, not only robotic technologies uh, but also humans to go to Mars and that requires uh, the same challenges like you know how to get there, uh, how to capture uh, a uh, asteroid, how to grab it and you know, how to contain it and slowly bring it back to uh, say say a, um, a lower I mean uh, cis lunar space which is very close to lunar space and then try to mine it and then try to make sure that uh, we can bring the materials back safely. So, uh, asteroid uh, redirect missions also have been planned. So, asteroids could be redirected to, to uh, go near the moon or, uh, or near, even near the space station. Again, uh, the, the, you know, the, the plan is you know if you do not retire the space station we will have the ability to have astronauts right on the station. So, NASA is looking for funding to continue the space station until 2030 if possible. So, let us see how it that goes. So, really what will it uh, take to send uh, humans to Mars? So, here is a beautiful picture of uh, Earth and Mars, two worlds but one sun. So, understanding the propulsion systems because we need high speeds, longer duration uh, travel, Martian resources, environmental constraints, uh, human limitations. So, really what NASA's philosophy is test what you fly, fly what you test and we have been doing that since the Apollo days, but now the challenges are even um, insurmountable. So, Mars is cold, it is farther away from sun obviously. So, you know as we go farther and farther away from the sun, you know obviously it becomes very cold. The temperatures uh, are you know uh, much colder than what uh, we can survive now. So, there will be a lot of issues to make sure our astronauts are safe. So, and do not forget you know our goal is to have uh, live and work there just like we are living in uh, a low earth orbit right now on the International Space Station. So, unlike Mar earth Mars uh, is very thin atmosphere we talked about how to you know if you come too high you are going to have a problem, if you come too low you are going to burn up in the atmosphere. So, uh, oxygen is another problem we need that we are lucky to have plenty of oxygen on earth. So, now how do we get oxygen up to Mars? So, on the International Space Station I am taking what they call as composite over uh, wrap pressure vessels. These are aluminum tanks and these uh, tanks are about 2 meters in diameter and we are putting 6000 psi uh, oxygen and taking up to International Space Station. So, why do we need that? You know a lot of times our astronauts have to go outside the International Space Station like gravity, movie gravity and they want to repair or do some put a alpha magnetic spectrometer which is uh, a beautiful uh, spectrometer to be uh, sitting outside or look put some materials outside the space station to do testing. So, that we are learning tech new uh, developing new technologies so that we can use those technologies for Mars. So, obviously, I cannot send this uh, 6000 psi tanks for 6 months some if you if it blows up where is we are going to be in deep trouble. So, we have to think about all those opportunity uh, uh, options and what are the limitations as well. So, now uh, how do you protect your organs and stuff like that you know we need to develop new suits you know basically because of the gravitational uh, influence their uh, influence with radiation basically. Uh, all these space suit technologies are being developed as we speak and uh, we have a good understanding of uh, how to go about that. Every time an astronaut spends a lot of time in space uh, low earth orbit even including we are talking about losing 1 percent to 
uh, one percent of the bone and muscle loss. So how do we accommodate for that? So uh, Scott Kelly just came back, staying about a year. So he grew about five centimeters. So basically, after three months, maybe he'll come back to normal, maybe six months. But we have issues of um, making sure that astronauts don't lose bone and muscle mass uh, as we go to Mars. So basically, our mission will be a failure if uh, the, the health of the astronauts becomes a problem. So we do exercise about two to three hours a day on what we call as uh, air aid or uh, resistive exercises. So we have to push against uh, to make sure our bone and muscle mass are active. So, well, radiation is also in a big problem there, basically. It's a big potential health problem. And, um, you know, even on this International Space Station, that gets uh, much more radiation than one would be flying um, on the uh, planes, you know, we go, uh, which goes only up to 50, uh, uh, 50,000 feet or uh, 60,000 feet, basically, or 20,000 meters high. So now we are 200 kilometers high. So we have to worry about radiation. Obviously, we need to uh, shield uh, the housing for the radio. I mean, uh, housing for the astronauts have to be shielded from radiation. So we are looking at a lot of different technologies, uh, including you know using hydrogen-related materials, uh, basically trying to uh, build structures and stuff like that where they can be shielded from the radiation. So the gravitational pull we talked about. Obviously, you know, on Moon it's one sixth the gravity and on uh, Mars is one, uh, one third. So people able, will be able to jump higher and lift more on Mars. But the problem is, you know, um, how do we sustain this for a long duration? We don't understand that yet. Well, on Moon we understood and we knew what to do and stuff like that. So, but not on Mars. Uh, obviously propulsion technologies, uh, radio communication takes about four to 20 minutes. So if you're going to send a message to a rocket to land properly on Mars, by the time you get the message back, it would have crash landed. So there's no way, recourse for us. So we have to develop technologies. Uh, right now, NASA is working with ESA to develop technologies like atomic clock ensembles, so where we can precisely tell exactly the time, and so we can send very signals very fast by uh, keeping some relays and stuff like that uh, in space. So these are satellite relays which could be put in space. Well, even though Mars is about 100 uh, million kilometers away, uh, we need to understand that you know, we have the technologies today that, that uh, we can um, develop uh, you know, a, a base for mankind to go up there and uh, uh, stay up there for a longer, long duration uh, time frame. So what kind of careers, you know, we talked, uh, I think uh, earlier we talked about careers, engineers, we need engineers, a lot of engineers, different kinds of engineers. And these engineers could be civil, structural, you know, mechanical, you know, all kinds of engineers and scientists and geologists to mine and understand what kind of, uh, 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 and medical doctors, things like that. So not only engineers, but there are many, many types of careers, engineers, scientists, to, to improve the quality of life on, on Mars. So in conclusion, uh, we, had uh, definitely had many, many attempts to land on Mars using uh, you know, a phased approach like flybys, orbiters, orbiters and landers. You know, um, obviously, you know, we have landed rovers uh, to, as you saw, uh, definitely the next step is man on Mars. And that's going to be uh, happening right around 2030, so we're not too far from where we are. So now scientists from all over the world are working together and trying to understand the similarities between Earth and Mars and uh, see how we can uh, capitalize on what we have learned on, on Earth, trying to see how we can live on Mars. So for a better community, you know, these are some of the various uh, um, uh, uh, tenets we need and um, how to communicate, you know, what kind of uh, medical devices you need to make sure that uh, we, we can uh, make, take care of the people when we go up there. Obviously, we need food. So right now, uh, NASA is growing uh, uh, romaine lettuce on the International Space Station on a project called Veggie. You know, so basically, we are sending mice 
uh, fruit flies uh, to understand and stem cells trying to understand the, the changes in human uh, you know physiology and you know as understand the aspects of long duration travel or stay in space. Well, food is uh, we just talked about um, veggie, but you know we are working to today right now at Kennedy Space Center trying to uh, develop or, or use the soil basically understand the 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 uh, uh, understand the chemistry of the soil to see whether we can grow uh, you know grow uh, vegetables and self-sustaining things up in Mars so we don't have a big weight penalty to send things up in Mars. So just like your home, you know, uh, nothing different. You know, there are uh, many, many technological solutions we need like water, power, you know, uh, shelters, you know, medical technologies and stuff like that. And these are the same things. And there is tremendous opportunities for new generation of engineers and scientists. So really uh, science and math are, uh, you know, very important. And engineering is a conduit which uses the science and math skills which you learn in, in Curtin and other universities, which will eventually develop technologies, not only for Mars, but what we call as technological spin-offs, which will benefit the entire mankind. So really we are working off the Earth for the benefit of Earth on the International Space Station, as well as we'll be doing the same thing on Mars. So technologies which need to support uh, to go uh, for the humans to go to Mars are uh, outlined in this. But robotics is very important, obviously. Uh, optical communications is very important. I put a probe on ISS recently, it's called Opals about a year ago. Opals sends a laser beam onto a spot in California. So as we are going around the world, uh, as we come across California, this base station in California sends a signal back to the station and they communicate and there's large amount of data download from the International Space Station on laser. So amazing technology. Um, we are sending probes to the International Space Station where the probe is pointing towards the ocean waves which can, based on the height of the waves, we can predict the weather and stuff like that. So the first thing Opal said when it beamed back to Earth, it said, hello Earth. So <laughs> that's the first orbital communication as far as a using lasers basically. So this solar electric uh, um, and solar uh, ion propulsion engines, the current technology uh, provides the chemical propulsion engine exhaust to go at Mach 4, Mach 3. That's about close to uh, several thousand miles per hour. Uh, uh, basically uh, 2,000 to 3,000 miles per hour, you know, uh, about 3,200 kilometers in excess of that. So now we are looking at uh, ion propulsion engines and exhaust coming at in excess of more than three to uh, three hundred thousand kilometers, you know, uh, per hour. So these are the kinds of solutions we need to go up in space. Cryogenic transfer. We are already using cryogenics to work on the International Space Station as well as on the uh, shuttle. So the shuttle or the space shuttle. Um, main engines use liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, those are cryogenic engines and that, that is what made uh, um, the space shuttle uh, possible uh, to fly, uh, uh, launch like a rocket and land like a plane. And these are same technologies uh, required uh, which we have already but the application would be totally different when we want to go to Mars. So future exploration of Mars as we uh, talked earlier, Definitely NASA is sending uh, not only robotic missions, but you know, uh, human endeavors to Mars. And um, are we going to colonize Mars? May not be yet, but we want to make sure that, you know, we want to see how Mars is going to benefit, um, benefit uh, uh, the or improve the quality of life on Earth. How does it do it? How does exploration of going to Mars benefit us on the Earth? Just take a look, a look at the example of International Space Station and all the technologies we have developed in the past last 50 years, your uh, mobile phone and internet technologies and microwave ovens, uh, MRIs, brain surgeries and stuff like that. Many, many technologies developed, uh, I won't say all developed by NASA, but 
uh, derived from NASA technologies on the commercial side using what we call as spin offs. So, same thing we will be developing uh, using uh, 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 technologies we are going to work with uh, on the Mars and uh, there is profound implications. Uh, you have not even seen anything yet in terms of technological innovations. And one simple example I want to give you like International Space Station, we built a living breathing monument, it, we called it the palace in the sky using the space shuttle which is a cathedral of technology basically for all mankind. It is a earth observation station, we talked about climate change, we talked about tsunamis and um, earthquakes and many, many issues on the earth including forest fires or fires in Perth. All these things can be observed as we go every 90 minutes. We start from Perth, every 90 minutes we go around the world on the ISS at Mach 25 or 28,000 kilometers per hour and we see 16 sunsets and sunrises. So, we can monitor everything happening on the earth. So, this is a like a uh, uh, you know like if you go to the beach you have a lifeguard you know this ISS really represents a lifeguard for the whole world basically. So, your life is not in danger because we are watching your other earth and that is the only place we have right now. So, so the confirmed man uh, future Mars missions um, obviously, we have plans to send a lot of uh, uh, robotic missions, but also uh, uh, you know manned missions to Mars. But right now our goal is to have a sample return mission and uh, uh, you know there are several activities which we are looking at basically. So, ExoMars was one aspect of it you know, but we are looking at uh, Marvel in future and we are looking at Ares um, to understand the environment in Mars. Obviously, we need to look at the sample collection and return. So, all these things are in the run in future. So, where will all this lead? Well, in my opinion even if mankind never uh, goes to Mars uh, unlike you know we landed on moon and working on the uh, living and working on the space station. Just, just look at your technological innovation just 100 years ago we could not even fly in you know we could not fly you know you know we could not even fly 10 feet off the ground. Now, a probe called Voyager 1 has gone beyond the solar system beyond the bow shock 16 billion miles into the interstellar space you know and it was designed to go only beyond Mars, but it do, did a grand tour of the universe I mean our solar system and went beyond the bow shock now. So, if I can do that anything is possible. Thank you and we are ready for some questions. So, I am the real Martian. <laughs>